And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection. I'm here with Robert. Welcome to Open Connection. I'm your host, Robert Picto. Our show today comes to you from the traditional and unceded territory of the Simshan people. Equity is rooted in social justice and fairness. True equity begins by acknowledging there are unequal starting points for some, and it makes a commitment to address or address these imbalances. On today's Open Connection, two First Nations chiefs share about their communities. LNG Canada had, had made their final investment decision, and it's important for our nation for that huge progress to occur because it then gave us an opportunity to become uh, one of the, become owners, majority owners of the one of the largest infrastructure projects that's being proposed for Canada that is First Nations owned, First Nations led, uh, with all of our core values uh, in the forefront of all of our decision-making process. So in, a, in that sense, that's where we've come and how far our nation um, has been able to participate within that equity piece. Yeah, just, um, I think the question was just around moving towards equity. What does that look like for you, you know, and your leadership and, and for your community as you move forward? And what does equity ownership mean? And or how does that look to you? Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, Crystal, for sharing a little bit of that in your, the background and the experience that we as ind Indigenous people have had when we see the industry development and we see it pass us by. I was younger, I, I got to witness the forest industry within our territory and Kikatla wasn't a part of it. And, um, you know, when I look at the history of our people, I don't look at the history of us as being poor. I, we're looking for prosperity, but I don't look at us, our history with the sad lens of being poor and poverty. I look at that lens of what does equity mean to us? How do we get involved? You know, like sometimes, you know, like today I had a conversation and I think when it comes to equity, it's an un uncomfortable conversation to be had by some proponents and with industry, with government. But at the end of the day, we're all, I think when we're looking at equity, we need to look at inclusion. We need to look at the principles of respect. The yeah. relationships are at the forefront of all the work that we need to do. And I say that because without that relationship, we cannot build trust. And there's, there's simple principles, but sometimes I think when it comes to equity, the conversation would be difficult, uncomfortable. It's a new path and a new experience that we need to co-create co together. And I believe that if we're gonna go down that path, that is how we create win-win situations I don't want to see, continue to see us going down the path of taking to be heard and to be seen. I've, we've had the conversations that as the First Nations, we're no longer going to be tokens within this arena. We're going to be participants, we're going to be included, and we'll create those pathways, we'll create those relationships. If we're going to be looking at reconciliation, we need to have the tough conversations of where we are now and where we want to go. So when it comes to looking at the history of Indigenous people, I look at it as what can we learn from it, what can we do different, and how are we going to do it together? I had a conversation this morning uh, around how um, we lead with our passion. We, we lead with what we want our visions to become a reality in our communities. And a lot of our support for our nation, for these large uh, industrial projects, is to create to, to create opportunity for our people. And and I say that in in every aspect of of what we're what we're able to do. I I apologize. I'm not here alone either. 
I would like to acknowledge my Baba Nelson who's sitting in the crowd and also Teresa, Teresa Windsor. Uh, tomorrow you're going to hear about our language programs and how that is a huge driver of my passion to be sitting up here talking about how we've, we've become a part of solutions for our people and how we work on behalf of our people. And we've found that independence through industry and partnerships that we've created uh, with, with our joint venture partners. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. You have a job if you believe work is the only way to make money. You have a career if your work is central to your identity and sense of progress. You have a calling if your work contributes to something beyond yourself. Let's return the conversation with Crystal and Linda. You know, the, the, every aspect from employment opportunities, training opportunities, and I'm, t I'm not talking about construction, low-level jobs. We're talking about employment to careers. And these are sustaining households and providing that environment for our people to find avenues to essentially re-identify ourselves as Heisless. And I mean that by our people are learning our language. We've, we've been able to invest in our, in our people on so many levels. And the most important one that I find absolutely inspiring is hearing my twin sister speak our language. The first time I heard her speak, like five minutes of fluent Haiza, and it brought me back to thinking about my grandmother. That's what we're trying to create. That's what we're trying to be a part of when we're talking about equity participation. We don't want the impact benefit agreements anymore. We want the equity and, and that ownership and also bringing our values to the table in regards to what we want to accomplish. And that's not only from the elected level, that's from our, all of our hereditary systems. And I'm I, much like Linda, when I hear our hereditary chiefs speak, and they don't have much opportunity to be at our tables and to be in, in venues like this, listening to essentially what have been my key messages for the last three or four years. They say that on their own. And it's so inspiring to see our visions align of what we want for our people. Want to add anything to that? What about any projects or um, joint ventures that you're working on in your community that you would like to share or talk about that you can think of? So, I, I and I I was just told that you guys have built um, some some new homes in your community. Uh, we're we're just finishing a project of a 23 unit apartment complex in our community. And those are some things that we've been able to create because of partnerships and, and our participation within industry. We're solving our people's, um, we're not solving all of our problems in our community, but we're able to provide solutions such as affordable housing with a 23 unit apartment complex that essentially our council said, we're not waiting to go through a bureaucratic process and red tape. Our people need these, these apartment complexes now and, and I'm happy to say that we should be opening that building within the next month or two. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think for Yekatla Nation, you know, the, our ability to participate and to be included, you know, for our governing council, we've been able to allocate resources where needed. I'm very proud that um, for Yekatla Nation, um, after a 20 year span, we have 13 units, housing units being constructed in our community. They should be um, ready by December for move-in. You know, we've done a lot of work. We do a lot. Of, it gives us the ability to, to plan strategically, but not only just to plan, but to actually see those plans come to fruition for our nation. You know, like, like Chief Smith spoke to the language program, we've been able to allocate for our language program. We've been able to allocate for our food sustainability. You know, Kikatla, Kikatla Nation is no 
We're not exempt from what's happening with climate change. We are not exempt at all from it. And, you know, we are looking at ways of how do we prepare for climate change? How do we be part of the solution for climate change as well? You know, and those are big, that's a big item that it, it weighs heavily on me when I see what's happening in the environment and how do we plan for it. And I, I bring that up because um, without these opportunities, we wouldn't have, you know, I don't want, we're not going to be sitting on a sideline watching and waiting for someone to save us. We're going to be participating and coming up with our own solutions and ideas. And I'm always reminded of, of Senator Murray Sinclair's words that education got us into this and it's education that's going to get us out of this. So because of the, our partnerships, we've been able to create more opportunity outside the Indigenous service, or I call it the Indian Affairs box. It was a small box, you had to fit in it, you had to conform to it. But for Cake Outland Nation, we've been able to develop our long-term education strategy and plan that all our people will know what true education is. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. In addition to residential schools, the Canadian government and Christian churches enforce Indian day schools. The federal government used day schools as tools of assimilation against Indigenous children until the late 1870s. Let us return the conversation as Linda shares about education they'll be able to experience what true education is compared to what my parents and my grandparents experienced in the Indian residential school compared to what I experienced in the Indian day school. You know, like I last, on the last term, I actually campaigned about education and conversation I had this morning again was about education that, you know, um, it doesn't matter that I have a degree. My people don't probably don't care that I have a degree. What they care about is to know that I care about what's important to them. Their safety, their, their community development, education, their children, and having conversations about how do we create those pathways for their children. When I was a youth, my field trip was across to Digby Island. It was to Gitgat and to Prince Rupert. I want our kids to see the world. The world's at our doorstep every day with the globalization. And we're, as Indigenous people, we're wed ready and willing to be a part of it. Hello, uh, my name is James Brown. I'm a counselor at District of Port Edward, where we, we, we were going to have a uh, PNWLNG. Most of you guys remember that? And uh, it got our hopes up. And my question to uh, Chief Counselor uh, Crystal Smith is, um, how did you handle all the negative press and the professional protest areas that just fear-mongered everybody? They, um, they may have cost us our LNG. We, they, um, they groomed us, they, they brought us up for dinner, it was all this kind of uh, promises, and with it, we also had projects that were going to start and help us grow Port Edward, turn us around, and we were supposed to be down prosperous, prosperity road. And um, I'm wondering, how did you handle it? And I'm pretty sure you probably went through it. It it has definitely been. Um, that was the. The first protests, honestly, probably have been the most challenging of of my term um, as chief. Uh, but I'm very, very fortunate to have uh, to be surrounded by a very great thing uh, that essentially um, come together to to strategize and and to come up with key messages. Um, we've essentially faced every negative aspect. Uh, in in regards to some of the the comments being made 
um, essentially head on and and taking like like I said, I have I have a really good supportive team that um, essentially look out on on every platform that is available and see what the message that unfortunately read the negative messages and and come and develop something that is more grounded in in regards to the impact that we have with our people um there were no solutions prior to to be a part of industrial development uh our previous chief counselor uh ellis ross um would often ask what other solutions do you have for our people and i've i've always kept that that question uh in in my mind as as we discuss this we support these projects we support this development for our people and we found a balance in, in regards to that that impacts uh that have that have come and that we've seen essentially previous projects uh and their their impacts we've been able to learn from from that and uh, and write them into our impact benefit agreements to ensure that those that will never occur in our territory again. And in fact, we've we've used our participation with projects to be able to advocate for cultural um, species in in our territory that are culturally relevant to us to be able to support um, these projects as well. So enhancement uh, that has occurred. And I don't think that's told often enough to be, to be honest. Um, so essentially a good supporting team and, and being able to navigate that all, I personally always keep my people in my cart and in my mind as, as I do these, um, responses. I hope that helps. Open connection. will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. The vision of Nation and Nation is to start from a First Nations perspective on economic development and to bring together First Nations, industry, and government to engage in dialogue. In this final segment of Open Connection, Crystal and Linda take questions from the audience. It's uh, Lindsay Langell, uh, Pacific Pilot Marine. Um, you've t spoken about old direction that you've both taken and your principle to your vision. And you explained about sitting at the various tables. So it leads to the question, how is, uh, what's the response like from your community and what's the reaction to your vision and your full direction? I think for Kikat La Governing Council, one of the things that we do is we meet quarterly with our hereditary. We provide annual support. Uh, uh, annual reports to our nation and um, when I ran for office the second term first and second term I ran on transparency and accountability and we continue to practice that today in all our work we do in our strategic planning uh, we're very solution for oriented and uh, when it comes to our nation their response it's even within our nations, I have to say, we have to work to build our relationship every day with our membership, with with their focus groups, with our key areas that are having challenges. But we also try, I like to think that we're more strength-based than anything. I try to be strength-based and in all the work we do. And I think that if we weren't doing the right thing, I would not be the chief elected chief sitting here today. I feel confident that everything we do, like being, I'm, I'm very proud to say that I'm the first elected female chief for the nation. And I carry my people in my heart, like Crystal said. I have to think about them every time we make a decision. I have to think about them every time we want to create a pathway. And I think the support and the response from our nation has been very positive. As long as they're included and informed, and uh, sometimes, you know, when you look at 
uh, sometimes there's pockets of apathy there that we have to work on and um, we come up with a solution and we include our people. It works. Thank you. Did you want to add anything to that? So being a bold leader and how your community feels about it kind of roundabout was the question or? Yep. Is that a very similar process. Um, actually, when it came to being a uh, supportive of industry, we actually took an approach that was completely inclusive of our people and did a referendum process. So essentially got the mandate right from the, from the beginning, uh, did educational pieces. Uh, our, our council at the time uh, took the communication with our own members to a whole new level in regards to being in front of them, uh, regardless of where they reside. So when Linda referred to an INAC box, you would often only think of reserve boundaries and, and your responsibility to our, our members that only resided within the reserve boundaries. Our council, uh, because we have majority of our members that reside uh, everywhere in BC, mainly in uh, Vancouver, Vancouver Island, Prince Rupert, Terrace, uh, we do communication sessions in each of those venues to ensure that we are, we are getting um, as much information to our members that we possibly can uh, through our one of our, I believe, two of our impact benefit agreements. Again, we did the referendum process to ensure that we had the mandate from our people uh, to, to come along as that inclusiveness. And we've essentially done that in every aspect of all the work that we do uh, now. I have to think about the first time when I was elected in 2019, I felt like I extended the olive branch to our neighboring nations and um, with the uh, interest in working together. And uh, and it's, you know, it, it goes back to why uh, our panel discussion, uh, equity, inclusion, ownership as well. You know, we're not, um, as a Kikatla, we're not going to sit and be bystanders on what's happening within the area. Our, my ancestors have been here for a long, long time. And um, I'm really, I feel a lot of uh, responsibility, a lot of honor. And I believe that if I was to get that I invite, I'd definitely be there for sure. And uh, if I can't make it, I would ask our deputy chief or our development corporation to be there. But, you know, we cannot, my, when I think about reconciliation, it is about us having those conversations, the tough conversations that need to be had and looking at what are the solutions. And when I look at reconciliation, I feel like at, there's so many levels of reconciliation. And I, I think that's a conversation for tomorrow as well. But when we're looking at that within nation to nation, I it starts at home. It starts with each and every one of us. It starts with your chiefs, with my chiefs. But it also starts with us nation to nation, nation to provincial government, nation to federal government, nation to the proponent, you know. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind and heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictel.